This year marks five years since the assassination of Alexei Mozgovoy, a hero of the Russian Spring, legendary commander of the Ghost Brigade. Human memory is such that as years go by, we start to forget even the most significant events in our history, which happened before our very eyes. Alexei Mozgovoy became the embodiment of a national leader, a person who had the courage to speak the truth and to defend his motherland and the common people. I'm not a professional director or screenwriter. This film is made not for my own sake, but as a tribute to a great man, Alexei Mozgovoy. Revolution! Communists! To the noose! Glory to the nation! Death to the enemies! Glory to Ukraine! Glory to the heroes! Bandera will come and get rid of this scum. Glory to Ukraine! Death to the enemies! Ukraine! Above all! Ukraine! Above all! February 18th to 19th, 2014, Ukraine. The people who were in the Maidan, the people who died there, will forever be our heroes and our saviors. Until the elections, the presidential powers have been vested in Alexander Turchinov. Karimiya's parliament considers the question of independence of the autonomous republic from Ukraine. I wasn't overthrown. I had no choice but to flee Ukraine because of the threat to my life and the lives of my loved ones. Kharkiv is Russian. Kharkiv is Russian. Sevastopol. Sevastopol. Donbass. 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 Protests against Kiev's new policy sweep the East Lugansk, Zaporozhye, Donbass. People carry Russian flags and St. George ribbons. What's their concern? They are concerned about the mayhem. If we see this mayhem emerging in the eastern regions, if people ask us for help, although we already have an official speech by the legitimate president, we will reserve the right to resort to all means available to protect those citizens. And we consider this entirely legitimate. Before going on air, we received this footage from our colleagues from France Press on the road from Slavyansk to Kramatorsk, just outside the village of Yaznogorka. As you can see, people were trying to stop the armored vehicles barehanded. But the soldiers manning the tanks were determined. They kept moving, shooting in the air, despite the real danger of hitting one of the villagers. Why are you shooting, you bastards? What are you doing? I don't shoot. People shouted and asked them to stop, but in vain. As a result, one of the vehicles ran over a villager's feet. Put down your weapons, you are bastards. You are fascists. Vladimir Vladimirovich, you have been sent millions of letters and requests. No response so far. We hope that you hear the eastern and southern regions and will respond somehow. Somehow is the wrong word. You will respond as you should respond if you are a true patriot. We believe that you will not forsake us. So. Vladimir Vladimirovich, it's time to make a decisive move. Politics is politics, but your conscience should be clear. Yuri Tavr Goroshko, Stalingrad Channel, present. Среди оплывших свечей вечерних молитв, среди военных трофеев и мирных костров. Жили книжные дети, не знавшие битв, Изнывая от мелких своих катастроф. Детям вечно досаден их возраст и быт, И дрались мы досаден до смертных обид. 
Но одежды глотали нам матери в срок Мы же книги глотали пьянея от строк Раша, Раша И сосала под ложечкой сладко от фраз И кружил наши головы запах борьбы Донбасс, Донбасс Out with the officials who betrayed their own people Go away, off with you, go away Join the rebels and the region will be ours The first Ukrainian armored vehicles set off for Donbass in mid-April 2014. Cam as trucks with troops, armored personnel carriers, infantry fighting vehicles and tanks. The locals tried their best to stop them barehanded. Nobody knew that it was the start, the start of a war. Back then, Alexei Mozgovoy emerged as one of the rebel commanders. Silence! I'll say it again, these Kamaz trucks are going nowhere, not even Kamaz trucks. Alexei Mozgovoy was a unifying center. A lot of people found his ideas appealing. He had this charisma about him, and he was good at inspiring people during his public appearances. Before the Russian spring, Alexei Mozgovoy had been neither a politician nor an official. His life was built of different milestones. Since his youth, he had loved music and even joined folk bands. Lyosha Mozgovoy, well, first of all, he was a really responsible person. It seems to me that he had this natural, scrupulous integrity. His manner of singing showed that he was anything but an ordinary man. With his heart and soul, he loved both his country and the region where he lived his whole life. No matter where he went, did military service or worked, he was surrounded by lots of people. That's the kind of person he was, I guess. Everyone was drawn to him wherever he went or lived or studied. He had a lot of friends. That was the character trait which defined his path in life. Everyone who entered this territory is our trophy. The only way they will be able to leave is by a regular bus to see their grandmas or grandpas. Right, yes, away from the cables. On April the 7th, Alexander Turchinov announced the anti-terrorism operation. The National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine has made the decision to launch a major anti-terrorism operation led by the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Russian's foreign ministry lodged a resolute protest. Meanwhile, volunteers led by Igor Strelkov entered Slavyansk. The militia units which were formed under my command have not yet reached Donetsk. As I already said, the formation of a militia is a rather difficult process. Yes, we are now enlisting people into militia units, because I'm sure that the citizens of our region should at least be able to defend themselves. We are not going to attack, but those who would even dare to think about it must know that the people of Lugansk can protect themselves at any given time, in any situation, from any intruders. 
Well, basically, I heard of him and met him at the same time. It was late in April. After April 20th, 2014, when I received him after his arrival, that's when he told me that he was Alexei Mozgovoy. He looked around and realized that we had a serious organization. Those who are saying, I'm not going any further, I must protect my family, they are just wreckers and miserable cowards. Right now, we need to create an army to fight off the attack of the occupation forces. I remember the protest well. I don't exactly remember. It just happened. Then I went to see Alexei Mozgovoy. We talked for a little while, and after that I heard him say this phrase to me. Come to Yazny. We'll turn your hillbillies into real defenders. We came as a group of 11 people. We were not the first to arrive there, but let's say we were among the first recruits to join. After that, we started to entrench ourselves. So we dug 24-7. I am proud and grateful to the commander who made us do it. Well, he explained it like this. The deeper you dig, the longer you live. Look, missiles! May 27th, if memory serves me, at 5.30, fighters flew in, and this whole thing started. Today, a missile and bombing raid destroyed the militant's base camp. It was located half a kilometer from the Russian border, near the village of Yazny. According to intelligence reports, approximately 500 militants were killed. But thanks to our trenches, we all stayed alive. 300 people survived. One was wounded. That's it. Yes, exactly. They launched a direct air strike targeting us with precision bombing. But thank God I am able to prove wrong all the rumors and false information reported by the Ukrainian mass media that our unit was destroyed. The biggest pro-Russian. No, they even called us the Russian unit. The biggest Russian militant unit. They say that we were killed and they are taking a body count, but actually there are no casualties. We are all safe and sound. And since we have been declared dead by the Ukrainian media, we will live long. And that's how the unit led by Alexei Mozgovoy got its legendary name, the Ghost. Ghost Novorossiya Lysychansk. When we got to Lysychansk, I was appointed commander of a training unit. Actually, I had been acting as one since Yazny village, but there I got sort of an official rank from Moskovy himself. And there we would keep talking with him face to face. We would work together for the whole time I spent at the Lysychansk glass plant meetings, formations, everything as it should be. After redeployment to Lysychansk in May 2014, the ghosts started to conduct active warfare to protect the city and the surrounding areas. The combat phase of the Donbass war had begun. After consolidating his position in Lysychansk, he contacted me by covert telephone communication line. It was after I had been appointed Minister of Defense of the Donetsk People's Republic. He told me that he didn't want to report to Bolotov anymore and, if there was such a possibility, was ready to take my orders. I agreed to that and he came under my command. I didn't choose the Minister of Defense. I chose a wise commander who shared my beliefs. That was important for me. Minister or no minister, it didn't matter. He was the right person. That's why we joined forces and started to cooperate. I didn't join the Donetsk People's Republic. I stand for a united Novorossiya. And that's how it's been to this day. 
According to Petro Poroshenko, the army will continue active warfare with the aim of surrounding the regional central cities. That's what's left of the armored vehicles manned by the so-called National Guard after their attempt to enter Lysychansk. The road is covered with pieces and fragments. Can you imagine the force of the explosion that ripped off the one-ton turret of the IFV and threw it meters away? Alexei Mozgovoy's unit is now on the front line. The commander is commenting on Kiev's plans to lay siege to Lugansk and Donetsk. It was too wide a front line for the Ukrainian army. They are not able to conduct warfare covering this whole distance and properly coordinate all their actions. From the start of June, the Ukrainian army began to actively bomb the regional central cities of Donbass, Lugansk and Donetsk, trying to surround them simultaneously. Shelling and airstrikes were now hitting not only the areas around the cities, but their central parts as well. That's when the civilian death toll started. June the 2nd, an airstrike hit the building of Lugansk local administration. Citizens of the Lugansk region have to flee their homes. They are heading to Russia through the Izvarina customs point controlled by rebels, who have to ward off constant attacks by the Ukrainian army. Scared of the imminent danger of war, the menfolk of the country rush to the customs points. Well, my wife is already there in Rostov-on-Don, and my son too, so I pack my things and... We are scared to stay there because of all the bombings. What was the last straw? Well, I guess when they bombed the administration building. We had to leave because of all this fighting nearby. We didn't want to wait any longer. My wife is already on the verge of a nervous breakdown. They are now shooting right there. We have to leave. Where did they start? In the morning. International security checkpoint, Izvarina. I want to address the menfolk of our region. Many times we have reached out to you, urging you to join the ranks, to defend your homeland. But apparently the words motherland, homeland, mother, sister, have just lost their meaning for our men. I hope that what happened yesterday in Lugansk has finally opened your eyes. And now you will join us to prevent the recurrence of yesterday's events. Many of you, for sure, have already missed the boat and made a different choice. For some of you, it's important to sip beer. For others, to go to work. The rest just want to stay home and protect their garden. The lives of your countrymen are in your hands, in the hands of those who still haven't chosen. You see what's going on. You saw what happened yesterday in Lugansk. You know the situation in Slavyansk, Donetsk and Mariupol. You know what's going on in Lysychansk, Severodonetsk and Rubezhnye. You are perfectly aware of everything, but you pretend that you are not. I don't know how to reason with you anymore, what buttons to push. I've run out of reasons why it's important to defend our motherland. I hope you'll do the right thing if you have any conscience left. Ghost.
Well, throughout the history of Russia, since the times of Minin and Pozharsky, when the dark days arrive and the enemy comes to our land, that's when people like Mozgovoy arise. People who are granted with responsibility and talent by God himself, and they accept this responsibility and rise to lead the people. On July the 5th, under the threat of being surrounded and destroyed, the unit led by Igor Strelkov secretly left Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, Nikolaevka, Konstantinovka and Artyomovsk for Donetsk. Shortly after that, these towns were entered by the National Guard and the right sector. While expecting another attack, the local rebel units welcome new recruits. Those who fled Slavyansk have joined the ranks of the famous Ghost Battalion. Garik, Kot, Sidoy, these are the code names. And now they are a part of a famous battalion, the Ghost. The name speaks for itself. Again and again, the Ukrainian army reports its obliteration, but the Ghost keeps coming back. We'll turn this beauty into a carrier of winners. Tonight, Lysychansk was hit by an artillery attack. The Ukrainian army launched tube, rocket and missile artillery, including the Grad rocket system. Some shells hit apartment buildings. After this happened, he asked me what to do. Nevertheless, he made it crystal clear to me that they would hold the position in Lysychansk till the end. At any cost? At any cost. Then I took him to the map and explained that all his fortified strongholds would be destroyed anyway, just like the one before them. They would be wiped out within an hour together with the troops, because they didn't have any heavy firepower equipment or anything else. I described him how things would unfold. They would be surrounded in Lysychansk, and as happened in Slavyansk, the army would not attack, but block the rebels. And while he would be sitting in Lysychansk without any supply of petroleum and ammunition or military supplies, without any reinforcements, the Ukrainian army would advance in the Lugansk region. In late July, the risk of being surrounded in Lysychansk for Mozgovoy's unit became real. At the same time, the Ukrainian Wehrmacht tried to surround Donetsk and Lugansk. The two regional cities of Donetsk and Lugansk, a total blockade and several corresponding measures by the Ukrainian army will make the rebels surrender their weapons. I explained the situation to him and ordered him to leave Lysychansk and redeploy to the agglomeration of Pervomaisk, Alchevsk, Stakhanov, and with the forces of his brigade to establish defenses for this agglomeration. At first he argued fiercely, saying that he had promised to stay in Lysychansk, that he was prepared to die in its defense. I talked to him and explained one more time that the death of his whole brigade would not make any difference, no difference at all. On the contrary, it would be beneficial for the enemy. He would have no responsibility for this retreat. I took all the responsibility and gave him a strict order. If I hadn't done it, well, most probably, he would have died in Lysychansk, together with the guys from his brigade. The fact that today Lugansk is absolutely free from the Ukrainian punishers, all the credit for it goes to him. He did more than anyone in the Lugansk region. Really? Really? If he hadn't established a stronghold in Lysychansk, Lugansk would have surrendered in June. They just shelled the village. Have you got a walkie-talkie? And you? But then the situation got worse. There was the city of Kirovsk. After that, Mozgovy left Lysychansk for Alchevsk. And finally, he ended up behind us, behind me. My city became a mini Stalingrad. Pervomaisk, Kirovsk, Donetsky village, all of them were on the front line. Alchevsk. After the retreat to Alchevsk in late July, Mozgovoy discovered a food crisis there, sabotaged by the local authorities. 
I would say it's not a food crisis, but a power crisis. That's why I address you one more time. Civilians should not suffer from sabotage by the local authorities. I'm reaching out to humanitarian troops and battalions. We need your help. I, Alexei Mozgovoy, am relying on you. And humanitarian aid started to come from all Russia. And the boxes and sacks with supplies read simply and briefly, City of Alchevsk, the Ghost Brigade, to Alexei Mozgovoy. A significant part of humanitarian aid was supplied by the Ghost. Moreover, in the most difficult times, the guys from the Ghost opened six public canteens to ensure that people who didn't have a chance to eat properly at home could get good quality homemade food twice a day and free of charge. Schools, kindergartens, hospitals, they all kept working. They did whatever they could for the city. Nobody starved. All people received medical care free of charge. And it didn't matter if you were a civilian or a military man. I talked to people from Alchevsk. They told me that Alexei made a huge difference. They saw how things were going before the war, when there were police officers and authorities in charge. And they saw how everything changed after Alexei and his brigade came into the city. People said those were two different worlds. Everything was in good order. Yalta. In August 2014, Yalta hosted a large press conference about the future of Novorossiya. Mozgovoy was among the speakers. Now we have the following picture. Those civilians who came here to decide the issue of war have never been in one. Those people who want to become governors, members of various councils and whatnot, have never been to war. Then tell me, how dare they claim to represent these regions or other regions if they don't take any part in what's going on there? Don't take part in the birth of Novorossiya. If all the men here stand up, they will make, basically, a company of soldiers. I have a suggestion. All those who want to run for a governor, a council member or any other bureaucrat, would you be so kind to form a separate specialized designation company of soldiers and show the people of Novorossiya that you are worthy of becoming governors and other moochers? And mark my words, all those who keep wearing civilian clothes and decide not to come back home to fight for the truth, you will not pass. We won't let you. Stop smiling. And when he said those words, a whisper ran through the crowd. People in the venue exchanged glances and, let's say, they sensed in a way that this phrase was said way too soon. If all of you understood what I mean, then welcome to the Ghost Brigade. And the people in the crowd started whispering that, well, Alexei Mozgovoy just signed his own death warrant. One way or another, I guess he didn't hesitate, you know, as he had already chosen the trajectory in life that he would follow. And he clearly understood that it was now or never. Novorossiya will happen no matter what. Despite the fact that many people have been killed, that many people have fled the country together with the so-called leaders, it will happen. And he talked about Novorossiya. I guess we almost never use the names of Donetsk or Lugansk People's Republic. And let's be honest here, we fought for Novorossiya, for what we wanted it to be, not for what it has become. Borisovich was a very honest and genuine man. He would never speak in public appearances about something that he would not share in a private conversation. I mean, he didn't work the room. Everything he spoke about at the protests and conferences, those were his true beliefs.
We didn't have enough time to make it spot on, but the order there was better than in any other city. I had the order number five on my tables, on each and every one of them. It was such a time when it was difficult to maintain discipline without it. Remember some of the points on the list. Pillage, rape, robbery. As far as I know, there wasn't a single case back then. Mm -hmm. But that document held back a lot of people from rash actions. Yes, the crime rate dropped, I guess, several fold. Let's take, for example, that famous case when Alexei presided over the People's Court to have the audience sentence suspects accused of rape. At that time, people saw that order had really been restored in the city. On the one hand, they were criminals. On the other hand, we are not judges, and that's why Alexei let the people decide. At a time of complete paralysis of power, and even the complete absence of it, the decision to sentence murderers, rapists and drug dealers by a people's court proved its value. The criminal world of Alchevsk was driven into the ground. Please raise your hands. Who is against the proposed punishment? People are raising their hands. Anayev is accused of a serious crime, the rape of a minor. The people of Elchevsk spare the life of this person. The brother of a crime lord will not get off so easily. Death is the unanimous decision. He is notorious in the city for 18 rapes. The People's Court passed their sentence by a show of hands. Let the legal community say that this court is not perfect from the point of view of law, and so on and so forth. But it's the perfect form of people's power. It's time to remember that you are Russians. Time to remember your spirituality. The time has come, people. Wake up. The authorities used to let them do anything they want. Everything could be organized. Corruption, police, all of them were in the loop. Even experienced officers were amazed when they discovered this place. Hundreds of cannabis bushes cover several meters. This easy-to-miss house near Alchevsk turned out to be a cannabis lab with a fully integrated mass production cycle. The lab was in operation for several years. Everything was delivered from Europe through the territory of Ukraine. I guess this is spice, the chemical that is added afterwards. I mean, they are diluting it. And I think they were selling it in bulk. We have the leftovers. People just abandoned it. This is the biggest lot? Yeah, this is the biggest lot. The biggest in the history of Alchevsk. Law enforcement bodies have never recovered more. All drug supplies were stopped and drug dens were shut. People were beyond grateful that they had not been left alone with their problem. Meanwhile, the ghost did whatever it took to keep life normal in Alchevsk. If only any other city could become just like Alchevsk at that time. In autumn 2014, Muzgavoy decided to conduct a series of video conferences with the Ukrainian side. He wanted to establish contacts with the officers to stop this fratricidal war and point the weapons at those who had organized the bloodbath. I suggest not raising the issues which divide us. Look, let's focus on those aspects that will help us to better understand each other. Yes, but during the Maidan protests, you know, nobody let us do that. We didn't have enough time back then. They just told us, this is the enemy, go there. And we did. 
But now we understand that we are fighting each other to please someone else. Borisovic was sure that we were fighting a fratricidal war. And that's why it was pointless. He wanted to stop the war, to reconcile the conflicting parties, to make them stop shooting. And he initiated a conference. Alexei, I think these are the first steps which most probably will be taken to stop for good. It's important that we started the dialogue. Exactly. You know what? I talked about these dialogues again and again with journalists too, both Russian and Ukrainian. Borisovic saw clearly that we were all fighting not for territory, but for people's minds. And unfortunately, we started to lose it. Because apart from Mozgovoy, back then, nobody was doing the work he was doing on that territory. I want to address both parties to the conflict. In the end, we, as I already said, are killing each other. Instead of punishing those who must be punished, we're fighting against oligarchs, both parties, but we're killing each other for some reason, committing a sort of slow suicide. Isn't it time to come to senses, gentlemen? The Debaltseva kettle has become the focal point of fierce fighting. Right now, the Grad rocket systems are targeting the positions of the Ukrainian artillery, which keeps shelling the territory of the Lugansk Republic. Fighting raged in Uglegorsk and Debaltseva. Ten kilometers apart, this distance is essential. The kettle can close. Thousands of Ukrainian soldiers have been surrounded in the Debaltseva kettle. The rebels have taken control over the village of Mikhailovka, several settlements along the road Donetsk-Gorolovka, and liberated Uglegorsk. The retreat of 8,000 soldiers has been intercepted. The rebels promise to let go those who will surrender. An attack is a tricky thing. It has to be smart and well thought out. First of all, you need to cover the enemy's firing points. And then you can take some actions, right? Until it's done, we won't put our people in danger. People's lives are more important than the ambitions of some generals and politicians. I'm sorry, Commander. I'm going to shoot you. You know, your house is something. It's good. Why are you so white, for God's sake? And slippers. Slippers are not allowed. I'm wearing socks. See this? I'm sorry. Have a good look. Yesterday I was talking with Slotinsky about some questions. Yeah, some military issues. So we started to talk, you know, and he got so mad when I told him that we didn't keep people in trenches. I told him that it was not 1914 anymore. We have limited the tactics to reconnaissance and sabotage. It's enough to terrify and stay alive to destroy the enemy and save our men. How so? But the Ukrainians have companies in trenches. How did they get this information? Why should we follow their example? Yesterday they asked me, why don't you have any casualties? How so? Yeah, you should fulfill the plan. Exactly. People fight and get killed. Apparently, you are doing nothing. This smart and tough stand of Alexei Mozgovoy on the fighting near Debaltseva allowed the brigade commanders to minimize the number of casualties among the military personnel. We were able to plan how to enter the kettle of Debaltseva. And this ensured that instead of absolutely stupid frontal attacks on well-defended targets and districts, we chose the tactics of step-by-step -step advance into the territory with consolidation at every position. Put it on the bell and hit the tower. Are you okay? Yeah, almost. I'm good. That's it.
Hello to the Ukrainian mass media, ICTV, TSN, and other shitheads. I'm here, as you can see, and I'm alive. Near the enemy, where I should be. My brigade is here as well, safe and sound. A bit tired, but that comes with the job. Compared to other units, we actually didn't have that many casualties. There was none of this tub-thumping jingoism. And as far as I know, Borisovich would think everything through carefully before giving orders to move on. I won't go into the details, but we received requests, let's put it this way, to move out to some square which were rejected by Borisovich pretty harshly. I mean, the units of the Ghost Brigade didn't go there to avoid any kind of unfortunate situation. We are now near Devaltseva, about three kilometers away. Our forces are trying again to liberate it from the Ukrainian Nazis, their army. I think this time we'll succeed. February 13th, early in the morning, the first units of the Ghost Brigade entered the outskirts of the village of Vazmoya Marta. Where's Arkadyevsk? Breakthrough in Debaltseva, Station 31. Breakthrough in Debaltseva, Station 31. Roger that, roger that. Keep us in the loop, keep us in the loop. Copy. We can't attack in two different directions, but there's no time. We are now in the village of Vazmoya Marta, near Dubaltseva. Yeah, we're ghosts. Look at that. Yes, they destroy us all the time and capture our sabotage parties. Where are they? It seems that we are a real ghost. That's where the name comes from. The headquarters of the Ghost Brigade became a sort of coordinating center for all the other units, scattered near the village of Vazmoya Marta. People would come there, coordinate their actions. And little by little, the number of people grew from a massive group. Later, other units would enter the territory through us. Here's fighting never stops. For the last four hours, people of Debaltseva have been coming to meeting points near the administrative building, central hospital and two schools. There they hand over the things they decided to take with them and board the buses. The former building of the railway station administration had a bomb shelter left from the Soviet times. And about 40 or 50 people were hiding in there for almost two weeks. Can you imagine? No water, no power, no food or medicine. And the smell, you know? Some of them couldn't even walk on their own. Many of them had severe ulcers, you know, and skin was rotten to the bone. When we got there, it was a living hell. The next day, we took away nine people in the most critical condition, those who couldn't walk. They came in armored vehicles and put us in. After about seven kilometers, they put us into buses and we came by bus. Where are you from? Debaltseva. After when the gunfire settled down a bit on the third or fourth day, we started to transport them by armored carriers in buses. Well, basically, we would take them in an armored vehicle to the railway point, and then we would get them by bus to Alchevsk. Like angels, like angels, they took us and whoosh! That's it. All my guys are angels, I know. You as well. May God and angels be there for you and help you. And God will whoosh all evil. 
People were beyond grateful that they were not abandoned among the ruins of their city, that we gave them medicine and some food. We managed to find accommodation, facilities for those people who'd lost their homes. We sent them to the hospitals. We treated them like they were part of our family. And yes, indeed, they were very grateful and appreciative because they understood that we weren't the enemy. We were just like them. Future hero, my boy, take care of yourself. Look at you. Then let me continue to serve. Go on then. At night, a sniper and a spotter ran into the kettle. Today, the flag of Novorossiya appeared at the highest point. It's a special symbol, because people from both of the People's Republics of Donetsk and Lugansk took part in the battles. More than that, the so-called president and the armed forces of so-called Ukraine kept saying that this point is unwinnable ground and nobody could ever take it over. But then we did it. We took over and we won. The Ukrainian president arrived in Debaltseva and referred to the soldiers there as heroes. Petro Poroshenko keeps saying that there is no kettle in Debaltseva and the army is not fleeing, but leaving as planned. My fellow Ukrainians, now I can announce that this morning the armed forces of Ukraine, together with the National Guard, completed the operation of the planned pullout of military military units from Debaltseva. 80% of forces have left the territory. We are expecting two more columns. No enemy detected, over. Copy that, finish the sweep. Akhadich, <laughs> it's SPG. Driver, are you there yet? Poroshenko forever. I mean, Mr. Poroshenko just announced that everything is fine and everyone has left the kettle, but it's not true. You can see the result. An incredible piece of equipment. State of the art. I'm very grateful to the Ukrainian parliament and personally to the president of Ukraine for this army surplus store they never shut for us. <laughs> it's Novogrigorovka. Yeah. They abandoned everything. Whoever brings the sword will leave a tank. For example, after we took over the fortified area, we discovered lots of pieces of equipment, like tanks. In our company, we couldn't have them. So I called Alexei and said, come and get the equipment. I know your brigade needs it. We talked about this. The Ghost was a pretty independent fighting unit, a brigade, with all the necessary support systems, like medicine and transport. At one point, we started to feel like we were in some sort of a vacuum, because officially humanitarian aid kept coming into Lugansk, and it was, of course, distributed somewhere. But we have never seen a single gram of grain. Cam A's trucks went only to Donetsk and Lugansk. Maybe there were a few isolated cases where people received aid, but the amount was so tiny that it was almost negligible. However, people want to eat every day. They need to get food supplies every day. I'm not even talking about financial aid, but food should be distributed on a daily basis. To put it nicely, Muzgovoy had a very uneasy relationship with Lugansk authorities, and... They projected these troubled relations into the whole brigade. In spring 2015, the amount of humanitarian aid was reduced drastically. Back then, Borisovich set the task of resolving the issue of supplies for the brigade personnel. In the entire history of the Ghost Brigade, not a single truck reached Alchevsk. Mazgovoy made the decision to restore collective farms, kokos, 
or as he called them, voyenkos, military farms. This organization will become a collective farm, not a private enterprise, but a collective operation. You will appoint the management yourself. And after that, you will be able to resume the production process. In any case, the decision has to be taken. People were literally drawn to him. He always had their support. Let's take, for example, Zakarchenko or Plonitsky. You know, they were no competition to him. Why did I come here? Because I went to war. Since March, I have been going against that power and this power. I'll keep doing it until they stop just having the status of power and start acting. Until they start working for people who put them into their office. I'm fighting not for the fight, but for the decent life of the people of our country. This incredible energy infected all those around him, and it made people take actions, do things, because it was simply impossible to sit still when this vortex of a man was running around and getting things done, not just speak about stuff, but actually do it. If there is a public official sitting somewhere in an office, in an administrative building, it means that this person takes on the responsibility to fulfill certain functions. If he can't do them, get out of the office. But why? Are they still there? Because you let them. <laughs> Who should make the decision? There are officials who should be responsible. It's people who should hold them accountable, not another official. He was a simple man and quite straightforward, and people always get the feeling about a person standing in front of them. And ordinary people knew that he spoke the truth, and even more so, he could fight for it. Because it's not enough to speak the truth. You should have the guts to stand up for it. Not everyone can do that. I'm telling you, we can't do everything at once. We'll start here, see how it goes and then move on. Fine? Can you please start with us? I've come five kilometers just to see you and ask you about that. Well, I've heard you. And now we know that the poultry plant is the next stop on our list. Please, and drop by the village of Chervoni Prapper. People will come. I would love to go to the places and start this whole process, but I can't be everywhere at once. We'll support each other. Come visit the villages, see how people live. I'm a villager. I know about the villages. I was born in one. Really? Which one? Nizhnyaya Duvanka, Svatovsky district, which I need to liberate. Borisovich was the rock. He had, I don't know, this energy, as you know, which made you follow him. Today, not many politicians can say that they have that in them. He's a civil servant, that's it. He has to fulfill his duties. If he can't do it to the fullest extent, your tax money goes to waste. If Alexei Mozgovoy had been alive and they had let him engage in public services and activities of the Republic, then it would have truly become a people's Republic. It was he who gained people's trust. He knew what to do, and how. Dear friends, let's not waste any time because... You need to go? Yes, it's four already. We need to look around in the daylight. Of course, good luck. Keep us informed. Thank you all for coming. I'll keep you in the loop and we'll ask for your help if needed. Sure, we'll go wherever you say, just don't stop. Yosha was a sort of a tank of a man. He saw the target and went for it. Victory Day in Alchevs was not supposed to happen for a series of reasons. Because with this parade, Muzgovoy undermined the ideal image of unity between the authorities of Lugansk and the people. And Igor Plotinsky, head of the LPR at that time, banned the parade in Alchevsk. But it did happen. It wasn't that big. We didn't prepare for it. It wasn't that big. 
We didn't prepare for it. We weren't ready. In the morning, we received the order to come. The guys got some uniforms. We didn't even rehearse. I remember I came in my combat uniform. Everything was in such a rush. And you know what? It was right then and there that I learned I was going to take part in the parade. I found a clean uniform. I had a set there, you know, in Alchevsk. And we started to march. We all know what it was. A big celebration for a particular city. Dress left. Dress attention. Front and center. Brigade, commander, comrade, the military staff not engaged in liberation of our land from the fascist Ukrainian junta has been formed to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the great victory. Chief of Staff, Colonel Shevchenko. Comrades, let me congratulate you on the 70th anniversary of the great victory. Hooray! 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 To defenders of free people, hooray! Three times! Hooray! 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 Glory to Novorossiya! Hooray! 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 Congratulations. Thank you. Let there be peace. Hello, congratulations. Thank you. No pasaran. No pasaran. No pasaran. No pasaran. No pasaran. The people of Elchevsk always welcomed the ghost very warmly. And he made a good speech. I would like to say the following. We have always defended free people, free will, honor and dignity, and we'll continue to do so. Don't listen to anyone. We will be able to protect you, to protect our heritage and, of course, the great victory. And we will not stop. He was the people's leader. They followed him willingly, not for some cool benefits, which he didn't have, not on order. They believed in him. Alexei, can I take a photo? Come here, everyone. You are a national hero. Alexei Borisovich, be healthy. Thank you. We are proud of you. Living up to his beliefs and principles of justice, he was fighting against not only Ukrainian neo-Nazism, but also the oligarchical system thriving in Donbass. The commander of the Ghost Brigade was attacked. His jeep, with his press secretary and his guards, was ambushed near this village of Mikhailovka. We were in Komisarovka, on the military base, sorting out the mess. When we went to the repair company, got a call that the guys had been shot. Zmei rushed to the place burning rubber. Half an hour ago, he learned that the car of his brigade commander had been ambushed on the road between Alchevsk and Lugansk, and everyone, including Borisovich, had been killed. He didn't want to believe it. He was trying to drive the thought away. Right now, he would turn the corner and they would tell him that it was just a silly mistake, a fake. But he didn't know that May 23, 2015, would become a black day in the history of Donbass. When we arrived, there were cars and some people. We saw a rural, if my memory doesn't deceive me. Their car was machine gunned with a Kalashnikov. Before that, a mine had gone off. Novorossiya. Yoka Hulls, with his head to one side, was sitting in the front. Mazgavoy fell between the seats. Anya, with her eyes open, was lying in the back.
Sasha, Sasha Pesnia and Metla in bandages and tourniquets were lying nearby. They had managed to jump out. Most of those who were in the car died immediately. So, Sasha Pesnia had some time to call his family to tell that they had been ambushed on the road. It didn't help. Paramedics who arrived at the crime scene examined the body and found two bullet wounds in his chest area. He had been shot point blank. When we arrived, we saw three shot up cars. One turned over in a ditch. In the black Jeep, there were the bodies of a woman and two men in uniform. The fourth body was in a ditch nearby. Then we took the fifth one to the car and tried to resuscitate, but clearly he had fatal injuries and had lost a lot of blood. Two bullet wounds in the heart and the chest. Two local witnesses who survived the shooting of the brigade commander's car were questioned at the site of the ambush. One of them, Anton Sereda, was driving in his company car and found himself straight in the crossfire. I was shaken pretty hard. I stayed lying down for some time, don't remember how long, and I kept hearing these popping sounds, lots of gunshots. Then it got quiet for several minutes, and I wanted to get out, but again I heard these popping sounds like they had started shooting again, you know? Then I heard a dull sound, and I felt something on my car, this sort of vibration going through my car or something, I don't know. The car was on the right side, on the right side, there. I smashed the windscreen, and there was a ditch somewhere, some kind of gorge. I fell in there first, lay there for maybe a minute, then I started to crawl. After that, I ran to the road. I reached the guardrail, which was there, you know. Then I crossed the road and went straight to the village. So we did a primary examination. Being diligent intelligence operatives, we knew how to investigate the scene, where to look to collect the evidence from the site. We looked once again at the damage found on the car, we checked the injuries, examined the place, where the ambush was organized, from where they fired. Traces show that they had been preparing for several days. There are a lot of traces of vehicles and they are the same. So they were preparing for two days maximum. There are no traces, which are a week old. There was an explosion. Yeah, it was organized, first of all, to have more of a psychological effect, you know, to force people to stop the car or change its path of motion. So as we saw at the site, it didn't do any severe damage to the car. It was like a firework. That's why it was bold, professional. I can't deny it. And like in the textbook, the shooters, after they finished the job, fled through a line of trees to the cars that were waiting for them. A lot of people knew about that. One other witness to the ambush of Mozgovi's car gave more details. At 5.31 p.m., there was a landmine explosion on the right side. Before that, I heard some muffled sounds of shooting. From here, in this direction, from here, in that direction. I called my guys and asked them to rush over here and bring me a gun. I was on my way to pick up my car. Did you see anyone? Yeah, three people were running there. Which uniform? Dark clothes? I can't say. They were pretty far away. We promised to do everything to keep the brigade carrying out the military tasks assigned to it. We were the brigade. And he, our brigade commander, will forever remain in our hearts.
The brigade will keep operating and fighting, in spite of those who wanted to make us afraid and confused. The brigade will live. We stand for the people who voluntarily joined Alexei to fight this war. They are no traitors. Borisovich was gone. Who? What? Doesn't matter. We were betrayed in the rear. The people's militia will do their best to make sure that those responsible are punished. We have police, people's militia and prosecutors working the scene. One of the versions is that a sabotage reconnaissance group, which also made an assassination attempt in March this year, murdered Alexei Mozgovoy two days ago. Later, this man, who became the general prosecutor of the LPR, would carry out the order of the local authorities, accuse Mozgovoy of organizing a crime syndicate in the Lugansk Republic. He was ambushed when the sabotage reconnaissance group I doubt that it was on manhunt on him. It's still not clear where this information about Mozgovoy came from. I won't go into details of the investigation. We still need to clear up a lot of things. But unfortunately, this is what's happening here. Nobody from Lugansk conducted an official investigation. At least nobody contacted me. However, it was I who had all the evidence collected at the ambush scene. Mobile phones, USB sticks, pocketbooks, personal belongings. All of those things were stored in our headquarters for a long time. Investigators could have come at any moment and taken them or worked with them, but nobody took any interest. We conducted the investigation ourselves without any help. I don't want to say right now who could have done this till the end of the investigation. I just wanted to ask you about this. Maybe the armed forces of Ukraine or some sabotage group which is working this territory organized a manhunt on Moskovoy. You know, there is such a version and it has the right to exist, but Nobody from the ghost believes in some sort of a sabotage group. I talked with a bunch of guys. They didn't believe it then, on first hearing, and don't believe it now. Well, at the moment, we couldn't announce any other versions of obvious reasons. We didn't have any evidence, any proof back then. We didn't know the whole picture of what had happened. It was a textbook example of a military ambush. It wasn't one sniper who did a single headshot. It was a military-style ambush with small arms and a homemade explosive device. For the first day till now, the officials have been saying it was a Ukrainian sabotage group. We were told it was a Ukrainian group by those gentlemen. But it's nonsense, from the psychological point of view, to be that far from the line of armed contact, to carry out this operation in open terrain, even the Ukrainians. I mean, they could have done it in a safer spot, which they could flee from quickly. Do you believe in it? Of course not. All people of Alchevsk came to the funeral of the ghost commander and his guards. The city has never seen anything like this in its entire history. People from the whole of Donbass came all the way to see their leader off on his final journey, their national hero. Alexei was a great man. In his death, in his poems, he predicted what would happen today. Each of us starting this journey makes a choice. We are ready for everything. We are ready to die, but thousands will follow us. Novo Russia will be, Novo Russia will live. Hello, I can't say it's a good day. You know why. We were good friends with Alexei Mozgovoy. We had a good relationship and we had our fights, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that Alexei stayed true to himself and to all of you. It's important to pay him our last respects today. 
But remember why he did all of this. Remember what he stood for and wanted to achieve. If all of us follow in his footsteps, I think he'll see it from above and will be pleased. Pavel Dryomov Cossack Ataman, assassinated on December 12, 2015. Alexei Mozgovoy was ready for this day, but we were not. To the words that have been spoken here today, I want to add this. People, we are here. We won't betray you. We won't betray his beliefs. We'll continue to fight. We'll continue what he started. We share all his ideas and views. And we will be glad to see those who support Novorossiya, the well-being and sovereignty of its people, who think that a people is not just a herd. We are here for you. We rely on your support. Eternal glory to our fallen heroes. Their bodies are gone, but their souls stay with us always. Только в грезы нельзя на совсем убежать. Краткий век узовав столько боли вокруг, Попытайся ладони у мертвых рожать, И оружие принять из натруженных рук, Испытай, завладев еще теплым мечом, И доспехи надев, что почем, что почем, Разберись, кто ты трус или сбранник судьбы, И попробуй на вкус настоящий. I miss him, and many others miss him too. They killed him absolutely cynically and bluntly driven by their immediate, selfish and dirty interests. Если руки сложа наблюдал свысока, а в борьбу не вступил с под лицом с палачом, значит в жизни ты был ни при чем, ни при чем. Если путь прорубая отцовским мечом, ты соленые слезы на уз намотал. Если в жарком бою испытал, что по чем, значит нужные книги ты в детстве. I'm wounded, but not dead.